Hello again. This is the first of a series of lectures loosely based around the theme of moral reasoning. These lectures are not a substitute for a semester-long course on ethics, and they don't aim to be. Nonetheless, I think it's necessary to understand some things about ethics and moral reasoning before we can talk about political theory, and so that's what I plan to do in the next six or seven minutes or so. Now, in my experience, students in this class are at often very different points in their development as moral and political thinkers. Some have a hard time figuring out why anyone should reason morally at all. Others have a hard time dis distinguishing between religion and morality. And others already have highly sophisticated sets of moral principles that inform their thoughts and actions. Now, I can't bring everyone up to speed in one lecture, but I can try to give some basic information about the kind of thinking we are going to engage in throughout this course and the kind of thinking the author authors you will be reading in this course are engaging in. But if there's something that you don't understand, please don't hesitate to ask. Mistakes about what kind of enterprise this course is can have far-ranging effects on how well you do in the class. So, this class aims to improve your moral reasoning about political questions. But before we can do that, it would be helpful if we got a handle on what it means to engage in moral reasoning in the first place. Every day, we are faced with countless practical questions. Some are fairly easy questions. What should I eat for dinner? What classes should I work on? Some aren't so easy. Should we wait to have children? Should I donate money to the animal rescue shelter around the corner or to the poverty relief fund for starving children in Africa? Now these are practical questions because they ask us to make choices about what we are going to do. It's certainly possible, at least some of the time, that there's going to be a right and a wrong choice about what to do. Any time that you make a choice, then, you are potentially subject to moral evaluation, and that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a fact. Any time you ask yourself whether something would be better or would be worse, you are engaging in moral reasoning, even if you aren't conscious of it. Now. We also happen to live in a democracy, and in a democracy, we all, at least indirectly, have to make some pretty complicated political choices. Now, I'm not talking about just checking off a box on your ballot, uh, R or D or something else, um, but I also am talking about the more broad political participation that you might engage in. What causes should you support? What kinds of political and economic institutions should you endorse? What rights do you have? And this list could go on pretty much forever. Now, how should ultimately we decide what to do in all of these kinds of situations, whether it be what courses should you work on or what kind of candidate are you going to vote for? One way to go about this decision-making process is to just go with your gut. Do what feels good to you and don't worry about it too much. And I think sometimes that's exactly what you should do. Certainly when deciding on what to have for dinner, maybe you should just go for your gut, with your gut. But how do you know when it's okay to just go with your gut and when perhaps you should take a minute and think things through a little bit more rigorously, a little bit more clearly? So at the very least, we're going to need to, some principles to help us distinguish the times when it's okay to go with our gut and the time when the times when we should sit down and think a little bit more deeply about the subject. So if moral reasoning or ethical reasoning, and I don't make a big distinction between moral and ethical in this course, if moral or ethical reasoning is the process of deciding what to do and what principles we should use to decide what to do, then political theory... Uh, is moral reasoning just applied to politics. Uh, that is to say, when we reason in principled fashion about when and how the state should act, we call it political theory or political philosophy. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute now, isn't thinking practically about what the state should do the field of public policy, or in some cases, public management? Don't they also aim to tell us what to do, practically speaking? Well, I think that's true. Um, but public policy and public management are much further downstream than political theory. Public policy tends to focus on narrow cost-benefit analyses. 
Uh, this means it's inherently consequentialist in its approach. And if you've done a little bit of your reading, you'll know that uh, the, looking at the consequences is not the only way that we can morally analyze state behavior or individual behavior. So for public policy analysts, better policies produce better consequences. Um, but there is a prior question, right? A more fundamental question. Uh, is doing a cost-benefit analysis even appropriate? There are times when tallying up the list of advantages and disadvantages is exactly what you shouldn't be doing, right? There are times when you should be engaging in a different kind of reasoning about what to do. Um, and so before we can do public policy, we have to decide whether doing public policy is even appropriate in the first place. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to I say that political theory is upstream from public policy, and public policy is downstream from political theory. And I think public management is even further downstream from public policy. That is to say, once you figure out what policy is the best, then you are going to have to figure out how to implement it and how to run a bureaucracy uh, that will successfully implement it. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, should we have a public policy on retirement and old age security? Now, that question is a theory question. Should the government be in the business of figuring out, of deciding when we should retire, at what age, and of setting up programs to incentivize our behavior in terms of our savings throughout our lives, as well as our um, decision to when to stop working? Um, that's a political theory question. Now, if you've answered that question uh, in the affirmative, uh, if you've answered that yes, the government should do something about that, well then, then and only then can you go on to the field of public policy where you're going to figure out exactly which policy best satisfies uh, the interests that the government has in these policy areas. And I guess even further downstream, if we ask ourselves how our social security bureaucracy should be run, then we're talking about public management. Now, I grant that in practice um, these fields are going to be uh, overlapping quite a bit, but you can see my point here. Political theory is going to deal with the more fundamental abstract questions about what justifies government behavior. All right. Some of you may not like to think about political theory much. Um, there's no question that there's a lot about the world we live in that's probably unjust. Uh, there's a lot that our public officials do that seems unwise uh, and foolish, but um, and being reminded of all of that is pretty uncomfortable, uh, especially if we think that we might be implicated in some of the injustice, injustices, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. Still, I think the fact that evaluating our politics and our states is uncomfortable doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Ultimately, the only way to get rid of this discomfort is not to ignore it and hide away like an ostrich, uh, but to deal with it. Uh, we have to find out what's unjust, why it's unjust, and what would count as an improvement. And the only way to make things better is ultimately to engage in moral reasoning, which means when we want to make our government better, we have to do political theory.